This is your dose of daily market wisdom with master trader Nick Santiago. Starting from humble beginnings, Nick has been beating the markets for over two decades. He shares with you his take on the profitable trades that will have you moving towards financial freedom in no time at all. To see an in-depth review of his track record and much more, go to inthemoneystocks.com. Welcome. This is your daily dose of daily market wisdom with master trader Nick Santiago. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 21921, and this is show number 209. Well, Nick, uh, markets uh, seem to be impervious to everything today, huh? Yeah, they're holding up very, very well. We got a flying higher market so far. But remember, this is an options expiration uh, week. So today is options X for the month of February. So you got a lot of institutional uh, traders uh, moving stocks in certain directions where they where they deem fit uh, for these things to go into the expiration. So we call this pin the tail on the donkey. Um, I have no idea what their overall agenda is, but they have it all worked out with the computers, and they 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 really know where they have to put certain strike prices uh, by the uh, close of today. Yeah, and no doubt they will be there so they don't have to pay off any of those options, right? That's usually the case, and that's why I always tell everybody, if you're going to trade options, give yourself some time on the clock. Never, ever trade that near-term expiration. Yep, yep, because you will uh, certainly get burned, that's for sure. And so, so really, you kind of just need to step aside if you're not like a, a master trader like you. Well, even today, believe it or not, I, I didn't even do much in this market. So, I mean, we had a, a pretty good gap higher open today. The volume was light. The markets just continued to go higher. But um, for the most part, I'm, I'm seeing a few different uh, things out here today where you have uh, the transports acting really well. They're up over 2%. That's a very good sign of strength. They also have the Russell 2000 up 2.4%. That's a great sign of strength. But remember, the Russell's been down all week. Today, it's rebounding. Uh, transportation um, stocks, uh, they've been a little bit on the weaker side the last three days. Today, they're rebounding. So, you know, this is just typical options expiration stuff. Um, but one thing I have noticed today, I think it's a little bit disturbing, and I've been seeing more and more of it, is that the NASDAQ composite um, ha is a lot stronger than the NASDAQ 100. So today, the NASDAQ composite right now is up about uh, six tenths of 1%. The NASDAQ 100 is flat on the day. It's up just up 0.04%. And th that's a little bit, when I start to see that divergence taking place too often, um, I'm always a little bit on the guarded side. And as you know, I've already waved a caution flag in this market, um, you know, going into uh, last week. So um, we'll, we'll see how it plays out next week. I think that's going to be the real big tell. All right. So next week and uh, later in the week, you think, or what? Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, you always look at, you never know what you're going to get. But I mean, tomorrow, I mean, Monday will be usually a light volume trading session. So we'll see what we get. And, um, you know, towards the latter part of the week, I think that as you get into the end of, of, of February, that's pretty much uh, more important. March is always a pivotal time frame. Um, I don't care what year it is. Uh, you always have to watch, uh, beware the eyes of March, right? So you always have to be careful in the month of March. Very, very pivotal time period. And I think it's going to be again this year. Um, something else I'd like to bring up, too, is that bond yields uh, are soaring and roaring again. You have the 10-year U.S. Treasury note yield almost at 1.35% right now. And, uh, you know, again, that's going to uh, raise the cost of borrowing money. So, you know, when, when you think about it, everybody's been getting these basically these cheap loans. Um, today, you have the housing stocks not really being bothered too much. But if yields start to creep higher, that's going to put a real crimp in, in uh, people buying new homes. And uh, if that slows down, that really slows everything down. Yeah, that's been the one bright spot in the economy it, across the country, even in the worst states with the worst shutdowns, because everybody's spending time in their houses and, and all of a sudden they realize how much they don't like their homes and they want to get a different one. And if they can afford it, and with all their stock market gains, many of you out there are able to afford it. Yeah, it really has been a, a big bright spot. And people don't realize how big of an of a market that is. So just think about it. If you're going to buy a new home, the first thing you're probably going to do is go buy paint. You're going to probably run to Home Depot. You're going to go to Lowe's. You're going to uh, furnish the home. You're going to buy appliances. So everything 
really stems off of people buying homes. It, it's just it, it really has such a trickle down effect uh, to the economy. Now, if if mortgage rates creep up there, people are going to say, wait a minute, I, it's my my monthly payment's going to be what? And they're going to back off a little bit. And if that slows down, I'm telling you, that has a huge trickle down effect. Just think about what happened in 2007, 2008, when, when the housing crash happened. I'm not saying this is a crash, but you could see how uh, that one industry affected so many other industries. Yeah. So hey, one thing I uh, wanted to talk to you about, I don't know if you like uh, – Watched the hearings at all on Robin Hood at Citadel and the, and Melvin Capital, uh, but uh, old uh, Maxi Mad Max Waters took uh, took Ken Griffin to the woodshed there. I, I did not get to see it. Um, I, I will probably go back and try to find a video of it, but I did not watch any of the uh, testimony. Um, I, I I would have liked to, but it, it was occurring during market hours, so. I just couldn't do it, but uh, uh, I'd have to go back and look at that. I'd love to see it. Hey, well, we always have said from the get-go when this Robin Hood phenomenon started that there's no such thing as a free lunch, and Zero Hedge has recently had some articles about how much money Robin Hood yields from basically selling your data and and uh, paying for or payments they receive for order flow from Citadel, which I didn't realize. Correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, but Citadel is now a market maker. That's correct. That's correct. And um, I, I don't know, I have not looked into any of the financials of what Robin Hood receives, but there's an old saying out there, there's nothing for nothing. Nobody gives anybody anything for free. So if, if these guys want to have a Robin Hood account and they want to trade uh, for free, free commissions, then yeah, they're going to have to, uh, you know, sell. <laughs> they're going to have to. Robinhood's going to have to make money somewhere, and they sell your your information. So, you know, and that's going on elsewhere too. It's just not Robinhood. It's going on at Schwab. It's going on at uh, at E Trade and and all of these other places. E Trade now is owned by Morgan Stanley, but it, it's happening elsewhere. So, you know, it, it it's the selling of data that is really the money maker now. Yeah, and then they take that data and they front run everybody, right? That's exactly how it works. I mean, they don't, um, you know, front run you by a dollar. They run front run you by, you know, a portion of a penny or so, or or maybe multiple pennies. But you know, they know where that where that order flow is going. And and again, that's that's when you use these free market makers. Um, you know, that's that's the cost of doing business. I remember like years and years ago, uh, people came up uh, when computers were new in banking. Programmers would come up with a program that would steal a tenth of a cent from every transaction in the bank and deposit it into an account. And it was amazing how fast that account turned into millions of dollars. Now you've got hundreds of millions of transactions, billions and billions of shares over the course of a year. And you can understand when you when you slice a penny or two off of every transaction that comes through your shop. Uh, the the profits are enormous. Yeah, and, and you know if you you know the funny thing, Kerry, you bring this up, but now I'm now I'm showing my age in this business. But if you remember back in the uh, old days, we used to trade with fractions. Now we trade with in decimals. And years ago, you would be able to trade and say uh, you would also be able to look at the dominant market maker. And then there was what we called a small order uh, entry system it was called the SOS, and there was a, a group called the SOS Bandits. But everybody was a SOS bandit. So basically you would just watch the market maker on the level two and you'd see, okay, Goldman wants to buy 10,000 shares of XYZ at 24 and a quarter. Uh, you know, you'd front run them a little bit and, and pay up. And then, you know, they would have to raise their, their, their uh, bid. So, it, you know, years ago, the small guy actually, if he knew what he was doing as a day trader, actually had a little bit of a, an advantage. But now, we have the electronic communication networks where everybody hides behind these market makers. You also have all the computer technology where you could just show 100 shares and have automatic refresh. Um, so the game has leveled out for the institutions, believe it or not. But it used to be a slight advantage for the retail trader years ago. Yeah, I had a friend uh, passed on now, Harvey Houtkin, one of the original Sos Bandits. And he, had, he was a broker-dealer. He got shut down 
during the crash of 87 because the market makers wouldn't answer their phones and he got all the stock from all of his customers dumped in his lap, basically had to close, and then they created that so system so that the market makers couldn't just refuse orders. And and that's what led to it, and uh, he built up a whole empire from it until they finally took him down. And he had his own ECN as well, but then, uh, you know, he had his own traders trading stocks and ECNs just to get the uh, the ECN fee, and the SEC put a stop to that. They kept cutting his prices and eventually drove him out. And he used to call the big houses MGM or Morgan, uh, Goldman, Merrill. And uh, he was always bemoaning the payment for order flow. Because it's nothing new, payment for order flow. It's just that now it's become the major profit center. That's right. That's right. It, it's, it's incredible how this has evolved really since the 80s and, and it, it is it is quite something um but now it's all about data and you know you see it everywhere it's it's not even um just a robin hood i mean we have we have companies out there that just collect data now it's it's incredible yeah hey it's a data-based economy that's i always call robin hood the facebook of of stockbrokers because because Facebook really, yeah, they make money on advertising, but it's the data that makes that advertising so valuable. And that's exactly the same model as Robinhood. And they treat your data with the same respect as do others in the uh, tech oligarchy land, or as I call them, our digital overlords. (laughs) But you're right. You're 100% right. And um, we see it everywhere. You see it, uh, I mean, more now so. It's more pronounced in all of these big tech companies than ever before. Yeah, and and it, they're capturing data for everything. Like, uh, they're streaming services, and they know when you pause. They know when you change a channel, when you go watch something else, or when you shut it off. And all that data is for sale to the highest bidder or bidders. And digital advertising and our whole digital economy relies upon the free flow of that info. And in Europe, they've been trying to rein it in. You have that German data protection law. And it's been uh, successful to limiting uh, limited amounts. But you can only imagine what's going to come up next. But getting the data real time, I mean, it, it's like uh, there's these things called refinance my mortgage or cheap mortgages or whatever. And they ask you... Uh, series of questions, get your contact info, and then that's instantly sold to the highest bidder. And then you get inundated with calls from mortgages, um, from mortgage companies trying to refinance you or give purchase mortgage, whatever. It's a data, data-driven data world. And uh, hey, so looking at uh, precious metals, up a little bit today, nothing really meaningful. We'll have to see what happens after the COMEX closes, right? That's right. Um, Right now, I mean, um, you do have a little bit of an uptick in um, the gold market today. You have gold futures up about $6.80. And then if you look over at um, silver futures today, uh, they're up as well. So silver still is the better play than gold. One thing I want to point out, though, today, um, with gold up, I am seeing the miners a little bit on the weak side. So the GDX today is flat. Um, but I was looking at gold miners earlier, like Agnico Eagle down 1.8%. Newmont is down uh, 1.1%. And then you had uh, Barrick Gold today down about 1.25% at the moment. Kirkland is down about 1%. So I'm seeing some weakness in a lot of these leading gold miners. Now, I'm anticipating them to pull back further and go a bit lower. But, um, you know, a little bit of a divergence there. I, I never want to see the gold miners uh, weaker than the metal itself, and um, that is what I am seeing today. So I want to be a little bit careful there. Okay, so does that usually mean the raid comes, like, within a day or two? Usually. <laughs> <laughs> so no surprises here, right? No, nah, no, no, really no surprises out here today. Um, but, you know, we're we're going to – you know, take this day and, and and see where we wind up by the end of the weekend. Once I get all my numbers, I start crunching them. I can't wait till uh, till the market's closed. Hey, well, when you look at it, uh, you know they're going to uh, uh, Fridays. They lo- and especially well, we're not quite the last Friday of the month. They love to uh, paint the tape 
on the, yes, on yes, those that, Fridays, on weekly closes and monthly closes. Absolutely, and, and especially the monthly closes, right? So, uh, but that that's even more so. But yes, the weekly closes are very, very important. <laughs> and painting the tape uh, goes on uh, every single week. In everything, really, it's in, so in everything, it's yeah. so blatant in this stuff. And and this being an options expiration, you know, a, anybody out there trading the last uh, 30, 45 minutes, you got to be a little bit careful in that uh, in that final hour. So, you know, these things can move all over the place today. All right. Well, hey, you want to see the trade of the decade? It's coming up. Time is running out. Just go over to inthemoneystocks.com. Take a look at Nick's trading record and uh, the strategies involved there. Also, take a look at the Twitter feeds, at ITMS, at NickSantiago01, and at Terry Lutz. Email us, kl at terrylutz.com, and we'll talk about them next week when things start anew. Have a good weekend, Nick. We'll talk to you on Monday. You do the same, Kerry. Have a great weekend. And so concludes another episode of Daily Market Wisdom with Master Trader Nick Santiago. Be sure to go to his website, InTheMoneyStocks.com. Don't forget the Twitter feeds, at ITMS and at NickSantiago01.